Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Rakesh Safaya. Dr. Safaya completed his internship at Government Medical College, Srinagar, India. He completed his surgical residency at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Bronx Lebanon Hospital Center in New York. Dr. Safaya completed his fellowship in vascular surgery at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Dr. Safaya is board certified in both general surgery and vascular surgery from the American Board of Surgery. Dr. Safaya is on the medical staff at Washington Hospital. Thank you everybody for attending today, taking your time off and uh, I hope that uh, I can make you aware this is a very important healthcare concern. Uh, which concerns us all. When we are younger, we don't realize it, but as we grow older, things start happening, or we see our loved ones, older people in the family get affected by problems, which eventually we will face them too as we grow old. So uh, this is uh, regarding an important topic, deep vein thrombosis, some facts, statistics, and the modern day treatment of it. So some of the slides you will see will be actual procedures which we do and uh, there will be pictures of uh, patients uh, with presentations of swellings and you know how it presents. So some of it might be a little graphic. Uh, basically we'll be talking about prevalence, risk factors, clinical presentations, other causes of leg swellings, the treatment strategies, and clinical experience regarding the cases we will be showing you. Now basically thromboembolic disease, what does that mean? Thrombus means a blood clot and embolism means when that clot, when it forms in any part of the body, can travel. That is the traveling process is called as embolism and then it can travel to various parts of the body and then it will manifest the presentations we see, like for instance, in this case, if the blood clot from the leg goes and travels with the flow of blood through the heart into the lung, it will present as chest pain, problems with breathing, problems with, sometimes you can have blood coming with spit. So those are various presentations. Similarly, if we have blood clot going into the brain, we have blood clot going into the bowel, so it will have different presentations. So that is the embolism part of it. So basically thromboembolic phenomenon, whether it is in the arterial system, the heart, the blood vessels in the body, legs, or the brain, that's a major killer. So that is the arterial thromboembolic phenomenon giving rise to heart attacks, strokes. And in the venous part, we have what we will be talking in detail today. That is the thromboembolic phenomenon in the venous system. And uh, with it, it is called as deep vein thrombosis when it is in the legs and when it becomes embolic, when it starts moving, goes into the lungs, that is called as the pulmonary embolism. So uh, will be, this is basically a commonest cause of death is acute vascular diseases, predominantly the arterial system and also the venous system with venous thromboembolism, VTE. So VTE itself, which encompasses the DVT, that is the blood clot in the legs, and the PE, which is the pulmonary embolism. This is the third commonest vascular disease. Now, it is a, you'll be surprised to know that more deaths occur from pulmonary embolism than combined with AIDS, breast cancer, and motor vehicle accidents. 
So that's a huge thing. And the risk of venous thromboembolism only increases with age. It roughly affects about 1 in 1,000 uh, people yearly. And DVT alone has 300,000 to 600,000 hospitalizations each year in the country. So there, out of them, 200,000 people die from pulmonary embolism. So uh, some more statistics, raw figures, occurs approximately in 2 million people each year and one third of them will get PEs. The combined annual incidence of DVT is approximately 2.5 to 5 percent of the adult population and it records in up to 5 to 10 percent people per year despite being on blood thinners. And 30 percent of the patients will recur in eight years time despite being treated adequately. So that tells us that there is a high incidence of recurrence of this disease. Despite being treated adequately, we still are at high risk for forming blood clots. Now, what are the risk factors for DVT? Uh, this will apply to all of us once we cross 40 or 50 years of age. So eventually, if we are lucky, we live longer and we will have uh, risk factors with it. So age, more than 40 years, history of cancer, obesity, previous history or family history of deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, history of recent surgery, paralysis or immobility from any cause, uh, people on contraceptives, younger people, or older people on hormone replacement therapy, uh, pregnancy is a risk factor for blood clots, and other serious illnesses like uh, congestive heart failure, heart is not pumping blood enough, uh, history of a heart attack, myocardial infarction, or even sepsis, plain infection predominantly all over the body. That also makes us predisposed to blood clot formation. And there are some specific disorders which are called as the coagulation disorders. So those we will be talking at length a little later. So basically, there is something in the body which if we have a small cut, there will be bleeding. But even if we do nothing, it will form a clot and it will stop if it is venous, if it is not into the artery. And if it is arterial, it will be jutting with the beating of the heart. So that's a serious bleeding. We're not talking about that. We're talking about general bleeding. Now, body also forms some clots within, inside. There is another system within the body. That is the fibrinolytic system. So what is that? Fibrinolytic system is a system when, we, when the body identifies that there are blood clots somewhere. So that system goes to that part and gradually dissolves that clot on its own without us doing anything. So there is the hemostatic system, which is if we bleed, it will form a clot and stop the bleeding. And then there is another system, which is those clots will be, body will try to dissolve them. How effective it is, we, we don't know that. Some people it will dissolve completely, some people it will dissolve 50% of it and some less. So that, that is what the fibrinolytic system does. So now we are talking about why should a person form clots? Some people have a disorder which is called as a hypercoagulable state, that they have an inherent tendency of forming blood clots. So what are those? There are some uh, conditions like deficiency things in the blood. Factor five leaden is a factor, blood factors, like we have clot, clotting factors. We have, uh, you know, factor one to factor 13, uh, absence of factor eight, hemophilia. We've heard about those things. So similarly, we have other smaller factors, which are, one of them is factor five leaden. This uh, heterozygous and homozygous is a form of a genetic presentation in a person. Homozygous means it is present on both genes. You have inherited it from both parents. So the presentation will be, it will present early and it will present very, in a very fulminant form. While as heterozygous is only on one of the chromosomes. So you have inherited from one parent. So that is the heterogeneous. It applies to every disorder. It can be homogeneous or it can be heterogeneous. So if it is a factor five lead-in deficiency and it is homozygous, so it will present very early. You will, a person will have a lot of clotting issues and high risk of forming blood clots for the rest of their lives. Next is 
hyperhomocysteinemia. That's another condition in the blood. So there is a homocysteine level in the blood. So those are increased in such some people and that gives them increased incidence of blood clot formation. Now there is a prothrombin gene in the body and if there is a mutation of that, that's the prothrombin gene mutation. There's, if some people have antiphospholipid syndrome, presence of lupus anticoagulants, these are the, the things which in addition to bigger things, these are the smaller things. Why do people, younger people form blood clots? These are the things we look for. And once we find them, another thing is antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein C and protein S deficiency. So these are the things when a person comes in, I did not fly, I didn't do anything, I didn't drive long distances, and a person is young. Why did they form a blood clot? These are the things we look for, and if it is two or more of these present, there'll be 70 to 90% recurrence of DVT in those people. So we have to identify it, and then we have to make strategies how to treat it. Now, uh, in, in those people, hypercoagulable state, they, they can present as unprovoked venous thromboembolism. They get a DVT or a pulmonary embolus at a young age. Next is they have recurrent episodes of venous thromboembolism. There is a positive family history. My father had it, my mother and my grandmother had pulmonary embolus, my father had a DVT, my mother had a DVT and patient is in 20s or 30s. So that tells you that there's a strong family history of blood clots. Now blood clot in an unusual location. Normal location is the legs. Next is okay, 50, say 85% of the blood clots form in the legs. 10 to 15 percent in the arms and the rest are very rare. For instance, there can be a blood clot within the veins of the bowel. There can be a blood clot within the veins of the head and a very famous personality, you know, she recently had it and, you know, we, it was in the news. There was a blood clot within that vein in the head. And so those are unusual locations. Why does a person form blood clots in such locations? Those are the things we look for. Is there an inherent tendency of that person to form a blood clot? Was there a hypercoagulable state in them? So uh, another thing is unprovoked DVT. For instance, common things, hey, I've been sitting for a long time. I traveled 16 hours flying. I traveled from here to LA. I drove, I didn't you know, break my journey. I just kept on flying, driving and I wanted to reach early. And then you, know, you didn't squeeze your calves, you didn't walk. So, this blood flow was sluggish going up back up and that's what we form clots. So if it is unprovoked, I've been doing everything regular, nothing, normal activities, go to my work, I, I didn't bump into anything, uh, I'm not taking hormone replacement therapy, nothing. All of a sudden there's a blood clot. Where did it come from? So that is an unprovoked DVT. And then like we said, uh, you know, birth control pills, hormone replacement therapy, Pregnancy itself, uh, bed prolonged bed rest. A person has a fracture and is bed rest. Now you know, we know that that person, if we are not giving anticoagulation or prophylaxis for DVT, they have a high incidence of forming blood clots. And even in younger people, unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss. So that also gives us an indication. Hey, we need to do a hypercoagulable workup in them and make sure they are not you know losing pregnancies because of hypercoagulable workup. Uh, so recently, not recently, about a few years now, five or more, uh, this has come to the forefront that, you know, we have to be very proactive about deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. Now, Surgeon General's call to action came in 2008, increased awareness about DVT and pulmonary embolism and we, we should have uh, evidence-based practice for this disorder because it's so common and we see it all the time. And they wanted to add you know, this clause that we should have more research at uh, causes of prevention, uh, treatment, and, you know, and the future of the disease. Now, how does it present? Deep vein thrombosis in the legs. So this is, this is the leg which has the DVT now uh, it presents with pain in the leg, swelling in the leg. There can be some color changes, becomes a little purplish, there's some uh, redness, 
that kind of a thing. Or sometimes we can have prominent veins which uh, project on the skin with, with these things. Like there's a little bit of pain, discomfort. I'm not able to walk properly. I get a little uh, you know, vague feeling of pain and something is not right. So that's another indication. Sometimes it can just be that. And if there is significant uh, swelling, uh, redness and stuff, it can go to a point where even the pulses, the arterial circulation gets affected. The pulses are feeble, sluggish. So we don't want to reach that stage. We want to be diagnosed before. Now look here. So this is the discoloration in the foot and with the swelling in there. That's another. This is few pictures, not so focused, but uh, just giving you an idea how it presents. This is another more worse, that it is red, it's swollen, and it's extending up to the thigh here. This is older gentleman with swelling, has a catheter in, and this is a sw swelling extending right down here. Now, what are the symptoms of pulmonary embolism? Sudden onset of uh, difficulty in breathing, shortness of breath. Uh, they can have sud usually sudden, but it can be gradual also. So in a day or so, hey, I was breathing fine. All of a sudden, it, there's a lot of distress with breathing and you know, I cannot breathe, I'm feeling tight, that kind of a thing. So next thing is, doc, I take a deep breath and there's a shooting pain in my side of the chest. So that is pleuritic chest pain because the lining of the lung is irritated and that gives you uh, gives a, a sharp pain in that part. We can pinpoint it. I get a shooting pain when I take a deep breath. So that is the pleuritic type of pain. And next is, if it is a little bigger segment of the lung, we can start having a little bit of frothy blood coming up with the spit. So that is hemoptysis. Person can have unexplained fever. In the hospital, we have fever and we're not able to get to the bottom of it. Why are we having fever? So gradually the workup and eventually it shows up that you know we may have small blood clots going into the lung. So that could be another reason. If the blood clot is bigger one and uh, we have the main vein which, go, which supplies the lungs, if a blood clot goes from the legs and just blocks it, it's going to kill us because there's no blood flow into the lungs. So that is fatal pulmonary embolism. Or if the clot then breaks into and goes into either side of the lung, it's a bigger chunk of the lung which is affected because there is no blood flow or coming out from there. So we start getting our blood pressure drops. We, we can start fainting because we are not having adequate flow into the lungs blood. Or blood pressure is so low that the person goes into shock medically. Shock, one shock is emotional shock, you know, what we see, but this is medical shock. Shock we define as loss of consciousness with low blood pressure. So that is a feature which can happen. Or, you know, one third of the people, first indication, drop dead, like a stroke. Stroke can kill us also. We drop dead. Same thing can happen here because there is no blood flow from the lungs going into the heart. It's a cardiac arrest. So this is a fatal condition, the pulmonary embolism. Now, causes of uh, swelling in the legs. We, we're talking about DVT, so that's one. We can have swelling in the leg also from inadequate circulation, that is arterial ischemia. We can have swelling from superficial filibitis, like you know we have varicose veins, or there is those smaller veins which get inflamed, that is filibitis. So swelling of the leg can be also other reasons, like there is fluid in the joints, and that gives rise to swelling below it. We can have, I didn't remember, I bumped into something, I was working in the garage, and now there is swelling. There can be a hematoma, so that's another reason we can have swelling. Baker cyst is a fluid-filled cyst, cystic thing behind the knee. So that is not within the knee joint, but outside it. There's a synovial fluid, which usually lubricates and keeps the motions intact. So there is excessive fluid in, the, in that cyst, and that can cause you know, pain and a little bit of swelling below it. So that is the Baker cyst. Conditions like arthritis can give rise to leg swelling too. Fractures, cellulitis is inflammation and infection within the skin, within the soft tissue, skin, subcutaneous tissue, and dermatitis, generally, you know, redness in the skin itself. 
So that can also involve the deeper tissues, become cellulitis, and then cause swelling of the leg. So what happens with, uh, there can be, this was acute leg swelling. Now we have, a, you know, longer term. Swelling has been there for months, chronic leg swelling. So usually uh, this DVT, modern day treatment has been possibly last 10 years or maybe a little longer. So we have ways and means of removing those clots and getting the flow of blood normal in those veins. So we didn't have it before. So people used to have blood clots, okay, take anticoagulation and keep the leg up. Wrap it, keep it up, and you know, that's how we used to do it. So that would lead to a condition called post-philbitic syndrome. And what is that? Philbitic is the DVT part. So there's inflammation within the vein or there was a clot within the vein. We treated it with blood thinners, coumadin, whatever heparin, coumadin, lovenox, and that was it. So like I told you, the body fibrinolytic system will gradually try to clean it out. So soften these old clots and get some blood flow through it. That is called as the recanalization. But how much is going to happen, we cannot tell. So there is what we call as chronic venous insufficiency. Veins have lining inside them and one way valves in them. So when there is a blood clot in the vein, the valve is not working normal. The valve is frozen, sort of. And then the flow of blood, there is no way of regulating it. The valves do not open and close. So that leads to chronic venous insufficiency. People get long-term swelling in the legs. That is because of reflux. These valves are not functioning well. They are supposed to open, close, and now they are just frozen at one place. And there was a clot in there, that part. So, and now body has done something that it has recanalized a little bit of it, but that's not enough. It's like the, the highway is blocked and only the feeder roads are open. So how much traffic can they handle? Same thing in the, within the body itself. So that leads to obstruction, that leads to reflux, and that leads to what we call as, I'll be showing you more pictures of this phenomenon called as the post-thrombotic syndrome or post-philbitic syndrome. Now the other causes of chronic leg swelling could be that our the pump, the heart is not pumping enough. So if there is a little bit of the muscle is not strong, it doesn't pump enough. So there is a little bit of backflow, it backs up all the time and over years. So it keeps on, it has nowhere else to collect. So legs are the most dependent part, so it, the fluid starts collecting there. So we get, get chronic swelling of the legs. Now there is other conditions like you know low protein, proteins we need to keep the uh, pressure within the blood vessels. So that is called as the oncotic pressure. But if we have low proteins, the blood does not stay within the vessels and the, it, it leaks out because it doesn't have protein to attract fluid. So that's another condition. Then there is other neurological conditions like uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Let's not confuse you with that. And then medications also can give rise to leg swelling on a chronic basis. Now, how do we uh, investigate this DVT? We are suspecting a DVT. The first thing we do now is we do a duplex scan. That's an ultrasound scan. So it's a non-invasive thing. It's a little probe which goes on the leg and there's a technologist who does it and we record the images and then the physician interprets them. So if there is any blood clot, in the, uh, the technologist sees it, he communicates it to the physician and the referring physician gets an immediate re report so that we tell the patient what needs to be done. This is very sensitive and specific for symptomatic person comes to the ER or a physician's office, talk, I have some pain in the leg and I have swelling, okay, get an ultrasound and rule it out. So that's one. Now the other modalities are we can do a CT venogram. We do a CAT scan and at the same time inject a contrast and then time the pictures in such a way that when the contrast is in the venous phase, in the veins, not in the arteries, because we inject something, it'll go into the heart and then it'll go into the arteries. So we have to know that what phase we are doing and see it, see those bigger veins, especially this is done for deeper veins in the belly. If we are not sure, 
that you know we have checked everywhere else there is no blood clot in the legs in the arms elsewhere and now we are still suspecting there is something which is forming clots and going to the lungs so these are the things like a CT venogram or and a MR venography not done so commonly but once in a while we do them now what are the objectives of treatment here number one is prevention of pulmonary embolism because we don't want if there is a blood clot in the body we don't want that to go to the lungs because that can kill us or that will give us more problems than just the clot in the leg now the other thing is we have to prevent the extension of this blood clot from the leg and going up further increasing in volume and then going up the third is we have to prevent the recurrence of these blood clots both in the leg and in the lungs and by this, the treatment, you know, we have to decide treatment so that down the road, people do not get what they have commonly been getting, post-thrombotic syndrome. When we did not have these treatment options, removing the blood clot, cleaning up the vessels, and resuming the flow of blood, normal, which we do now. But earlier times, if there was a blood clot in the belly, bigger vein, and the leg, I mean, we just gave them... Uh, Comedine for whatever, six months, one year, take it indefinitely, and there was no way of opening those up. And eventually, down the road, you would see five years, seven years dark, I get a lot of swelling, pain, starts with the discoloration. I'll show you some pictures. And that is the post-thrombotic syndrome. Now, we need to diagnose it quick, and we need to treat it quick. So we need to anticoagulate. What we do commonly is give heparin, which is anticoagulant, but it acts rapidly. So give that one within the, and we, there's better way of controlling it too. So we can control, if there's blood becomes too thin, we can stop it or we can reverse the heparin. If a person needs surgery, we have more control over heparin than other, other medications. So we can reverse this medicine also, and person can go for surgery. The other options is we give a low molecular weight heparin. So that is still a shot. We give it in the belly, say within the fold of the belly in the tissues itself. So that is the Lovenox. Possibly some of us would have gotten that. Then there are other newer medications, Fundoparinox. And you know, other, uh, those are direct factor 10A inhibitors or antithrombin medications. These are the, in the pipeline and some of them are already being used. Now, what is the rationale of treating these DVTs early? We did mention, we have valves inside these veins. Arteries don't have valves. The veins have valves because there is no, the heart pumps the blood out. It goes because the heart keeps on pumping, reaches everywhere. And then how does it get back to the heart? So the, it comes back through the veins. And the veins have a one-way valve like this. So the valve opens blood flows up and the valve closes. It does not let the blood to go back down. And our muscles squeeze it when we walk, when we do anything, that additional force to push it up. The next thing is nature has given us, we have to breathe to be alive. So with breathing, there are changes within the chest. With breathing, there are changes within the belly. So those pressure changes also cause a negative pressure and pull the blood from the veins in the leg and the belly up. And that is, those are the mechanisms which act when we get the blood back. Because there is no pump which is pumping it constantly, like the heart is pumping the blood out. So we have to make all these mechanisms efficient. We have to have normal functioning valves. We have to have patent veins so that the blood flows up. So what we do with the modern day treat treatment is we try to take the blood clot out so that the valves function normally. Valves are preserved so that we don't get the post-thrombotic syndrome, what we used to get when we had bigger clot burden in the body and no ways of removing it. So we also have to make sure that there is no recurrence because once we remove the clot burden, we remove the blood clots within the leg or even in the belly itself, so there is nothing which can go now which can embolize. So the embolism part also we will be preventing by doing the modern day treatment. <clears throat> now, 
ideally we would want to have as fresh blood clot as possible. So day one, day two, day three, that is the best clot we can have, blood clot, because it is still soft, we can put in catheters and we can put in some medication and it will dissolve easily. We break it up and then suck it out. I'll be showing you some uh, video of how we do it. So that would be the best thing. So when we have a problem, leg swelling, pain in the leg, uh, go to the ER, go to your doctor, get an ultrasound done and get it diagnosed sooner. And tell them, hey doc, is there a way we can get it to open up? We can remove this clot because still the awareness in the medical community is not so much, is not 100%. So people still believe, no, DVT, Coumadin, leg elevation, wrapping, and that's what we do. Yeah, that is true for most of it, but when the clot extends beyond the groin and goes up into the belly and completely blocks the main veins in the leg going up, those are the veins which we should be treating and removing the blood clots. Now, if it is a week or so older, last week I had swelling, pain, kept on procrastinating. I'm not going to go doc to the doctor. It's going to get better. So the clot is getting a little older now. Still, we are forced to go after a week. That's still good enough. So we need to still do if we can. Remove it, clean it out, do the treatment, blood thinners and stuff. Now, even if it is three weeks old, we still can do it. Now, when it gets older than that, then the incidence of completely cleaning it out is less. But still, I have done several months old DVT because if it's an older DVT, there can still be something fresh on it. Acute and chronic DVT. And acute part, we can clean it out. We put in that medication, clot busting medicine inside that clot and suck it out. So we are helping to recanalize some part of it, remove some clots and recanalize it. So that way we are, if we are able to open up any channel in that, that will significantly reduce the swelling of it. Now, the post felbitic syndrome presents, like we discussed, pain, swelling, uh, even down the road, discoloration. And you know, we've not been doing anything, still, hey, go to, it's fine, I've been taking Coumadin and stuff. And eventually it will form an ulcer, the skin will break down, usually around the ankle areas. Because that is where we have most of the pressure. The pressure in the veins is the highest at that point, because of gravity. We stand up so many hours a day. So the maximum venous pressure is at that level. And we have presence of perforating veins. There are small tiny veins which bring the blood from the deeper system into the skin when the valves are not working. So that is the reflux, backflow of blood within them. So that is why we form more ulcers or more discoloration in that part of the body. Now, this post-thrombotic syndrome, post-felbitic syndrome, it occurs in almost up to two-thirds of people who have had proximal DVT. Proximal is if the groin or above the groin veins are involved and they have been totally blocked. So we have seen that, you know, in five years time, most of them, up to 70% of them will have problems. Swelling, pain, discomfort, doesn't go away. I have to keep the leg up for a long time. And then still there's some discoloration, blackish, you know, discoloration in the skin around the ankle or around that area, inner side. And that is typical of post thrombotic or post pelvic syndrome. Uh, so the prevalence of this is basically 2% of people have even venous ulcers, generally. I mean, that's a big chunk of population we have. So we see all these in wound care. They, they say that, hey, doc, I was treated for a DVT several years back, and now, you know, it was extensive. I was admitted to the hospital that time, but now I've been having swelling. Now there is some discoloration, blackish things in the skin, and it, there's a wound which is not healing. So that's a typical presentation we see. Okay, so here we go. So this is the typical site here because this is the medial part, this is the ankle, and typically here we have maximum perforating veins there, which normally the flow of blood is from the skin deeper in, not the other way. So when we have DVTs or we have had reflux in the veins, the valves are not working well. So it is the reverse. It comes from the deeper onto the skin. 
and when the the blood is red because hemoglobin has oxygen with it so that is red if we take the oxygen out of hemoglobin it starts converting into a different pigment that is called as hemosiderin which is black and that gets into the tissues gradually over a period of time that blackish discoloration stays and that will stay permanently so this is hemosiderin getting deposited which which is a part of our hemoglobin because the blood is there is stasis of blood there is sluggish flow of blood and there is reversal of flow so that leads to discoloration in the skin the skin doesn't get good nourishment it doesn't receive good adequate oxygen and then we start having these wounds which are difficult to heal so this is a typical post thrombotic venous ulcer so why do we have it you know this is a slide there's increased venous pressure hypertension and there is reflux there was obstruction and reflux both so that gives rise to this so uh, basically uh, historically we've been treating it with heparin coumadin is the name for warfarin and then lovenox for possibly a couple of decades now so sometimes we need to place a ivc filter and what is that that is like a filter like thing which goes into the main vein in the belly that is the ivc so we either place it most of the times we go from the groins and put it in it's through a catheter there's no cutting involved just a small numb the groin area and uh, put in a under ultrasound look at the vein put in a wire put a catheter take a picture look at that ivc there's no blood clots in there we go ahead and put a filter because there are blood clots which are embolizing they are breaking off with the flow of blood and going into the lungs or we have significant blood clots in the legs and the person we cannot anticoagulate he is at recent surgery patient has problems has a gi bleed is not able to tolerate the anticoagulation so we cannot give him the blood thinners so in that case we don't want him to get this blood clot from the legs or the belly go up into the lungs so we put in a filter previously we did not have temporary filters but now we have temporary filters or retrievable filters we put in filters which we can take out so we had a window earlier as the technology progresses we get hopefully get better so we had filters which we had to put permanently that was earlier time lifelong next came the era okay we put in filters but you got to take them out in two weeks time now we are at a stage where we put in filters and we those are retrievable filters and we can take them out possibly in few months and sometimes even we have gone up to a couple of years in some centers with special skills but otherwise if a filter stays beyond its retrievable time then we prefer it to stay permanently because it can we can cause damage while we are pulling it out now we try to do uh, you know with anticoagulation give heparin sometimes we can have a problem with heparin uh, say one to five percent people within five days they start getting clots elsewhere despite heparin so they can get clots in the veins they can get clots in the arteries and that's the time we say hey let's know what is the problem and there's a condition called hit heparin induced thrombocytopenia the blood platelet cells decrease significantly when we start on heparin in the first few days and person can start forming new blood clots either in the veins or the arteries and we test for heparin antibodies and we say oh this is hit so we have to stop heparin in all routes iv subcutaneous iv flushes we cannot give any heparin there are alternate ways of treating that but this is a very bad hypercoagulable state that you know they can form blood clots anywhere arteries veins anywhere and if it's leads to a lot of amputations and even mortality with the hit diagnosis now with hit we need to stop heparin and then there these are the alternate medications we have instead of heparin we give these medications and make sure it's like hey i'm allergic to penicillin i am allergic to uh, heparin because we so commonly as we grow older we'll be exposed to hospital admissions from different things and you know they will be always using heparin flushes even if 
We don't do anything else. So that's an important thing to remember and for our, for our record keeping too. Now what are the, here we can talk a little bit more about what are the uh, predictors of recurrent uh, venous thromboembolism. Ongoing risk factors would be cancer, not moving too much, immobility, and if we have those hypercoagulable states, thrombophilias like, you know, uh, antiphospholipid antibodies, antithrombin, so that's for your doctors to decide, but those are the conditions which they need to concentrate more. Those could be the conditions, if they are there, we need to give blood thinners for a longer time. So, unprovoked venous thromboembolism, uh, you know, recurrent thromboembolism we can have. Uh, if we had a previous history of DVT or, you know, a person as we grow older, more, you know, weight, obesity increases the incidence of. Now, another thing which we can test now, we have stopped blood thinners. We needed blood thinners for six months or nine months or 12 months. Then we stopped it and we don't need it now. We can test for this, which is called as a D-dimer a month after we stop the blood thinner. And if it is, you know, still persisting, that means that, you know, there's higher incidence of forming recurrent blood clots. Uh, so usually, uh, first episode, unprovoked DVT, three to six months should be enough time to treat. Now, unprovoked, we didn't have any risks involved, no traveling, no hormones, nothing else, everything fine, all of a sudden got a blood clot, yeah, a little longer, six months, nine months, sometimes we even go up to 12 months. Blood. And if we have those conditions which are persisting or we have a hypercoagulable state, then it will be re indefinite. We have to continue with the blood thinners. With Coumadin, people have a lot of, uh, you know, bias. Some people, when we tell them you need Coumadin, oh, doc, absolutely not. I'm not going to be on Coumadin, do anything else. I'm not taking this Coumadin. So, uh, because it has a lot of interactions with other medications too, a and the dose of Coumadin is so variable. You cannot just, doctor tells you, take five milligrams and that's it. Okay, see the doctor in six months, no way. And in the, because Coumadin interacts with foods, Coumadin interacts, has interactions with other medications, even if they are over the counter. So the levels of Coumadin have to be monitored. And at least we have to do three to four weeks INR when the Coumadin levels are stable. Say for instance, person was started on Coumadin for DVT, initially gets daily uh, INRs or every two to three times a week till we stabilize. Okay, the dose of Coumadin is five milligrams for five days, maybe 7.5 for the rest two days, and the INR is between two and three. So INR is the most important thing which you have to remember. I tell my patients with DVT, that do you forget to take your food, lunch, dinner? No, you can forget one time, but not the second time. You're hungry, same thing. You cannot tell me, doc, I don't know what my INR is. No way. You have to know what's your INR. I tell them the same thing now. Some of them, I see many diabetic patients in my practice with peripheral arterial disease. I tell them, next question is, are you diabetic? Oh, 20 years. What's your HbA1c? What's that, doc? I mean, that is surprising and amazing. I tell them there's no way you can say what is that. You have to know it. We, it's our duty to tell you, but it's your responsibility too. If you are taking Coumadin, INR, you have to know. You cannot tell me I, I could not take the dose of Coumadin because I was flying and my daughter came in, my, I was busy with this thing, no way. So we have to be very particular about our health and these are the things which we have to know. Diabetic, HBA, HB, A1C every three to four months and if you are on Coumadin, an INR. Because if the INR is low, we're not doing adequate thing. You're not being protected. And if the INR is too high, there's a spontaneous bleeding can happen. You can bleed from while you're brushing. You can bleed bumped into something and it's not stopping. So there is high risk of bleeding with a high INR. Now, uh, these are other things like, you know, even Coumadin levels change with activity, drug interactions. Genetics, some, you know, since it gets metabolized through cytochrome 450, which is a metabolizing, which is a factory in the liver, which through which the Coumadin gets uh, metabolized. So that factory also metabolizes a lot of medications as, as such. So if that route is busy with other medications, we've taken 10 other medicines, and that's busy at that point, we take Coumadin. So it's not going to get metabolized. 
more of it will be, there will be higher blood levels in there. That's how we get into problems. Now, uh, we have over the years or decades, the technology has revolutionized in every field. Say for instance, heart attack. We used to have, okay, let's do a bypass, quadruple bypass, two times bypass, three times bypass. Now we don't see that so much. Why? Because technology has helped us. We have stents. Initially, we used to have plain stents in the heart. Now, even that would get blocked and people would still get surgeries done. Now we have drug-coated stents for the last 15, 20 years. So those stents are so good, they stay open for a long time. And people don't need bypasses. We don't see heart bypasses so common as we used to see 15 years, 20 years back. Now the same thing has been applied to these modern technologies to stroke. A person gets a stroke. Everybody says treat it as a heart attack get to the nearest ER, get to a stroke center. They will give you thrombolysis, they will dissolve the clot and you know, that will be the best outcome of this. And we have seen that, that is true. Now same thing for a leg ischemia. There's a blood clot which goes into the, the artery, the, the main vessel in the leg. So we'll have a severe pain, cold leg, and you're not feeling, having any sensations. Nearest ER, we can open it. But there we have more time to play, few hours, six hours, eight hours. But we don't have that time for the brain or the heart. So brain, less than three hours, ideal. They are pushing it to now four. So a stroke, go to the nearest ER, which has the capability of doing thrombolysis and dissolve that clot within the three to four hour time. So heart, yes. Now we have been talking of long time uh, door to balloon in the heart, less than 60 minutes, less than 90 minutes. So those are the yardsticks we have to come up to. So uh, same thing, now DVT, there's a blood clot in the leg, there's a blood clot in the lung. So why leave it? it it's gonna cause problems. So this technology was now shifted onto this field too. So uh, we have what is called as catheter-based thrombolysis. Thrombolysis means dissolving a clot whether it is in the arteries or it's in the veins. The process, the term we use is thrombolysis. So uh, we have to devise ways and means of dissolving a clot. Now, when it is in the lungs or the brain or the heart, we go with special catheters and put those small tiny catheters in there and put in some medication which will dissolve it. If we see a narrowed part of the artery, put in a stent and open it up and get the flow going. So that is the best thing we can do. Same thing now here. Now let's go down to some of the cases, actual cases here. Okay, so that's a catheter going into the clot. This is the clot in the leg. And then that's the medication we are injecting through this catheter into the clot. And then we wait for some time that's called as the dwell time. So we let the medication act on this fresh blood clot. And then it will become soft and we'll be able to suck it out. Okay, so this is another technology. This is a different kind of a catheter. So there are two balloons at the two ends of this catheter. So this is one here, a balloon beyond that uh, here, beyond the clot because we don't want that clot busting medicine to go elsewhere, just the part where there is a blood clot. So we are putting in medication through this and then beating it like an egg beater and soften it and then suck it out. So these are the catheter based thrombolysis. So the part of the vessel is clean now. 
will deflate the balloons and then get this uh, catheter out. Still taking out some. Okay, so now let's uh, see some real images of venograms. Venograms will be, we are in the veins because we are talking about DVT. So we take pictures, see how the clot looks within that vein in the leg and then do similar things and then see the end result. So this is a blood clot. We are, we are in the, this is the knee area. This is the catheter within that vein and you see all these filling defects. These are all clots in this part. Now as we go higher, we are going more towards the hip area. We are seeing blood clots all the way up and there is no, no blood flowing up here because this is, these clots are all blocking the flow of blood. So then there is a filter in there. Somebody has already put in a filter so that when we treat this part from the knee up all the way, we don't dislodge any blood clots and that can go up. So we block them. Now this is will be gradually opening up this vein. So this is right then and there. So these are completion venograms. Is this visible from the outside? This is a fluoroscopy in the cath lab or the interventional suite. No, not we we look at it with an imaging x-ray. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, these are the venograms with the catheter down in the knee area or the groin and then taking pictures. So now we have got the flow up all the way and that's the filter. So there is blood flowing through the filter up all the way, which earlier there was none. There was all clots in there. So we cleaned it out. See, this is a very distinct difference, although the leg is not so swollen. This is one of my patients. And look at the color changes. So this leg had a blood clot from here all the way up, like you saw the previous picture. So this is, uh, he's in the ER, and now I am accessing. He is uh, lying prone on the belly, and this is the ultrasound here, and we are trying to, because there is no blood flowing in even that vein. Typically students, you know, when we compress with a probe, the vein walls should, normal vein walls should co -opt. But here, there is no flow, so the walls are not, we're not able to compress anything. And even when you put a needle into that vein, you don't get any blood draw because there is no blood flowing in there, it's just clot. So possibly the next picture you will see. See, there is no blood, there's just a drop, it's not pre-flowing. It's a dark blood which is coming out of this. So we accessed it with a, using an ultrasound, look at the vein inside, not just fish it because there'll be more problems, we're giving blood thinning medicine. So just go right in and then put in a wire through this and then do our interventions. And this is, look at the color change now. This is right there on the table itself. So we, because we got a flow going from the leg, that's the reason why the color has almost come back. So there are some more cases here. This is the localized area in the femoral vein. So overnight thrombolysis. A catheter was put in and you know it in fact made it worse because the clot was segmental and now the clot has broken up a little and giving you a worse image. And then we, we use this catheter here. This is real time pictures, x-ray. So this is the catheter we are using like we showed the video demonstration. Now this is the real time picture and we are sucking out the clots in there. So this is called as the power pulse spray, PPS. And we clean it out, take a picture and we're done. Because we have the flow now there. So these are some more pictures, completion pictures. Now here in this one, we see a stent in there. This is like a mesh-like thing. Because there is a condition where we have, uh, ha occurs commonly in younger females because we have the main artery which divides like this and the vein is under it. So the artery is causing pressure on the vein. 
and this is a normal thing. But over years, over decades, there, it causes some changes on the vein. And then there is some narrowing of the vein there. So that is called as the May-Turner syndrome. So there is, cr because of the crossing, there is a stenosis, which becomes symptomatic when there is some other blood flow is sluggish, or patient got operated, or patient was on birth control pills, that both these acted together. And now we have a big, swollen blue leg, younger person. So this, that's a typical presentation of that syndrome, May-Turner syndrome. And once we clean that out, we have to stent that part, because otherwise it's going to again form a clot. So these are again some pictures where shown the, uh, the blood clot all the way, because otherwise we should, we should be seeing this as a black color, because that's the contrast. No flow in there. No flow up in the belly. Then these are the completion venograms. So after we cleaned it up, femoral, and then going up all the way. So these are some of the filters over the decades. Filter has started, I think, in the 60s. So uh, then uh, there was an important prominent person, in vascular surgeon, who made a greenfield filter. And then that, uh, that stayed with us for, I think, three decades. But now we have later, you know, that was a stainless steel. Then it changed to a platinum. Now we have nitinol, these IVC filters. And some of them, we take them out. Say, for instance, this one. This has a hook at the top. So when we have to take it out, we just put in a wire around it and grab it up. So why, when do we need to put in a filter, a person who's having blood clots in the legs and also forming some clots into the lungs? So those are the people, despite being on blood thinners, they still form blood clots in the lungs. We have to put it. Now, if a person is not able to take blood thinners, then in that case, we also may need a filter. Or we are doing one of these procedures, like thrombolysis, and then the clot was extending all the way up. I personally still put in filters first, because I want to be absolutely sure that I will not be dislodging any small clot into the lung. So once I put the filter first in, then later, couple of weeks, two, three weeks, or maybe a couple of months, we go and take that filter out. It's an outpatient procedure, and it's a very uh, simple, straightforward thing. Now, see, this is the filter, and this is the way to grab it. So this was the earlier filters. It didn't have a hook at the top. Now the later ones, we have a hook there. So these are some images, uh, you know, see on an MRI or a CT, we see blood clots in and how it looks like. And this was a duplicated IVC. So uh, this is a very rare thing. See here on a CT scan, we see how the blood clot is extending from the leg up all the way into the IVC. This is the main vein, the vena cava. And this is how it looks like when the blood flow to the, is blocked up here. This gets into gangrene. And then you know people lose their feet, legs, if we don't treat it adequately. See, this is, uh, this is a condition called as phlegmasia. Phlegmasia is... Uh, the Latin term for blackish discoloration. Phlegmasia, and this is venous gangrene. This condition can happen when there is absolute blockage of the flow from the leg itself all the way up into the belly. And they, because there is no venous return, and eventually they lose the circulation and ends up with gangrene. Now, this is the uh, slide which shows you where the artery crosses the vein. And that is wh where we get this narrowing for that syndrome called as the May-Turner syndrome. M-A-Y, May-Turner, T-H-U-R-N-E-R, Turner syndrome. Commonly happens in younger people, but can happen in older people too. They get a lot of swelling, and so there is sluggish blood flow because the artery has been compressing the vein since we are born, and gradually it causes those changes in there. So this is a cartoon showing you exactly how that happens what effects that causes on the vein. So it can form a spur, it can form you know, partial obliteration, scarring, and then gradually it closes. So uh, yeah, that's how it looks like on a venogram. Now this is uh, to show you how we grab these filters when we have to take them out. The sequence of that, this is the real-time pictures. So we, this was the older one without the hook. But now we don't have, this is a cone. We just uh, grab it, get the sheath on top of it, it compresses, and then we pull it out. So this is uh, how we access it. And that's an ultrasound we use all the time. 
because we don't want to be fishing around. We just want to look at the vein and then go, you know, after we are infiltrated skin and stuff, then we go in and look in real time image. And that's what we see under ultrasound. See, I'm accessing under ultrasound here. And that's the catheter within that vein. The catheter which is going to suck out what demonstration we saw on x-ray and the video. So that's how long the catheter is, how it looks like. And then those are the images how we see it on the screen once we do that. And this is post-procedure. Uh, say basically uh, DVT and PE, the, or we broadly call this as the venous thromboembolism. It's a major healthcare problem. And uh, you know, we, have, we have seen the decades old uh, treatments uh, like anticoagulation and leg elevation and all that. But now we, uh, you know, we have other modalities. And the best thing is that we should know, you know what are the risk factors we have it and uh, who are the people who get it commonly and what are the treatment options we have. So basically everything what you have seen, this is how one of the legs, you know, when it gets bad, uh, this is the part like I showed you in other pictures. Uh, this is called as the, uh, I, I have done few of these, subfacial endoscopic perforator surgery. These are the perforators which are bringing the blood back to that part of the leg and keeping the ulcer alive. It's not healing. So unless we close that and that is done away from it. So this is the inside picture of it. This is the perforating vein and we do it laparoscopically. Like, you know, we don't have to make a cut because that's not going to heal on that part. So we go away from it, put in a scope, and then ligate this and divide it. And that will help heal these. See, this is uh, the area, and then, you know, it helps heal these lesions. So this is a little picture. When we remove open clots, this is how, we, how big they are, how we look at them. They take the shape of the blood vessel they are in. And uh, then this is how it looks, so gross. And this is, if we leave a blood clot in there for years, these are the changes which happen inside the vein. So this is called as, you know, there is fibrosis, there is uh, spurs, there is web formation, scarring within. And how can this be a normal flowing vein if we have this thing after end result of a DVT? So that is the problems we have. That is what gives rise to post-thrombotic syndromes because the vein is not normal after a blood clot. So uh, I think that's it. Uh, now I, I'll be happy to have a lot of questions and answers. For you. I'd like to thank Dr. Savaya <laughs> for being here today. Thank you. Wish you a safe trip. <laughs>